So I've got my virtual device running. I forgot to bring my real device today, so I'm using a virtual device. And I've got uh, my work. It's on my desktop, but I imagine it's on my flash drive. Remember, the name of the folder doesn't really matter, but we want to keep it short, my SDCE. I'm just changing it every, every time for the, for the, the current date, just uh, so that I have a copy of it. But that's in the network folder in case you need it. Hopefully, you're working on your flash drive with your version of the project. So you should have uh, instructions 7 and 8. We've already gone through 7 completely, basically. Let's look at instruction number 8 in general, and then we'll do it together. Instruction number 8 is about your icons and splash screen. You must add your own app icons or else it will install the generic Cordova logo. So that's a mark of a beginner right there, that you didn't uh, change your icon. It's going to have the, the little Cordova mascot cube robot thing. So what we need to do is we're going to create some graphics. So how many of you have any experience in any graphics software? Raise your hand. Uh, very few people. I think most of us are a little bit more in the programming sense. So again, uh, when you're your own app company, app development company, you're going to need to do the programming, the graphic design, so the visuals, and then the marketing and, and all of that. And they're different hats, and you might be comfortable with one role more than another, and that's okay. If you're not very, very artistic, we will see that when we use software like Photoshop, it does help us. Obviously, if you have experience, you'll get better results, but we can still make some cool things with Photoshop with a minimum amount of effort. So we're going to need to make some graphics of different sizes. I pulled those off of the website, of course, and we'll go reference the website in a moment. We're going to make some graphics in a specific format. We're going to put them into specific folders in our project, and then we're going to reference them via code so that, we can act so that the app can access them. That's for the icon. Then we'll do a splash screen. You can add a unique splash screen that displays as your app loads in the following way. So right here, there's also some specifications and dimensions and such. So they're already defined for you. These come straight from the documentation. We need to define these. We need to develop these graphics in Photoshop, let's say, save them in specific folders, and then of course write some code to access them with a couple extra lines here. And then we will deal with um, the splash screen interval which is how long is the splash screen going to be visible until the app loads. And we'll see a, a little trick that we'll do here with that a little later. So that's what we're going to focus on uh, our time at the moment. And then our, our basic kind of skeleton of our project will be completely complete. We'll have a folder project, we'll have that config file set up, we'll have our project from last month, and we'll have these icons and splash screens. That's the skeleton. Then we'll focus on specific Cordova code, like working with the camera, working with vibration, all that cool stuff. But after today, we'll have the basic skeleton of it to keep adding to the project. All of this I got from the website, of course. So let's take a look at the, at the website. When I, whenever I talk about the website or the documentation, I'm going to mean cordova.apache.org, the Cordova website. Go ahead and open your web browser, and let's go to cordova.apache.org We've seen this before and we should know that when we go to the site we need to then go to documentation. Let's go to the site and then let's go to documentation. So we're over at the documentation, and unfortunately there's no easy address to remember there because this stuff changes all the time. So notice I'm on uh, that address, and it's version 5.1.1 in English, the guide overview. So there's no direct address, I think, that you have that you can remember, cordova.apache.org slash docs. I don't know if it'll go directly to it. But anyway, in our documentation, let's go to the chapter here on the left side to look at icons and splash screens. It's uh, near-ish at the top. Icons and splash screen. So it just explains what it is. 
what you do, which is a, a different, uh, it's a variation on what I had said a moment ago in my documentation. And so the code that I've got in the PDF, um, if we look at the first section, uh, I've got icon, source, res, android, etc., density. So we're going to have these different lines of code to display our icon in different sizes because you might have an older device and its icon was 36 pixels squared. You might have a newer device that's 192 pixels squared. So here we can specify different sizes of the icon for different versions of Android. And our documentation says something similar and with more detail. So we're going to have a meta tag, or actually an, H, an XML tag called icon source, which is where's our icon, and then other optional um, parameters. What's its platform, the width and height, and the density. And it explains here what those are. And there's an example here. If you're trying to add icons to the Amazon Fire OS, you would define a platform block and now the Amazon Fire OS, and then the different icons it can handle. Same thing for Android. You define a, an Android platform block, which our config XML file should already have since we added that platform. Define where our icon is at and what density it should be used on, etc., etc. The uh, iPhone one seems pretty complex because you've got the older versions of iOS devices which were not retina, which were not high quality screens, and then the, the later ones which were retina quality, which were basically double the size of, of uh, the original resolution. So you've got to, for iPhone, you've got to deal with all of these possibilities of, of possible icons for iPads and for iOS 6 and 8 and higher and so forth. To talk about Android fragmentation, look, we have to deal with iOS fragmentation regarding graphics. Windows Phone version, etc. Example configuration. Looks good. Supported platforms. And then the splash screen. How does the splash screen work? That's actually going to be a plugin that we'll look at later. So, the setup that we need on my handout here in your project root folder, create a folder called res, then inside a folder called Android. So, we're going to have various resources in our project that are going to apply to various platforms, such as Android. So what that's saying is, go ahead and open your folder project, just in, in the Windows Explorer. Open your, your folder project. That's the root of our project, the top level of our project. In this top level root folder here, then we need to create a new folder called res resources uh, so right click an empty spot in your project and then new folder res res so res resources let's create a new project uh, there's a new folder in our project res then open your res folder and in here we would have specific resources for each platform the specific icons for Android, for iOS, for Windows, etc. We're going to deal at the moment with Android, so create another new folder and call it Android. Lowercase, everything's lowercase so far. Excuse me, I didn't have the one I saved the 20th. You don't because I named mine the 20th. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I just copied well, the one from last week to my desktop and then I renamed it to the 20th. So in that folder, we're going to put a variety of resources, the icons and the splash screens. My instructions then say, uh, obviously easier said than done, create 24-bit ping files with transparency in the following dimensions. And they're going to be squares. 36, 48, 72, 96, 144, 192. We're going to create these little square graphics that are ping files with transparency, 24-bit, and then save them into that folder. Then we'll write our code. So this is the part where, okay, we're going to 
move away for a moment from code and we're going to get into graphics. If you don't have any experience in graphics, it'll be okay. I'm here to help. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Photoshop. We've got Photoshop on these computers. We'll use the number one most famous graphics editing software, but we can do this in Microsoft Paint. We can do this in uh, GIMP. We can do this in Pixlr, Illustrator, a variety of graphics software, but we've got Photoshop in this lab. So go to your Start menu and search for Photoshop. Looks like we have the latest and the greatest. Photoshop Creative Cloud 2015. So search for Photoshop in the Start menu and then run Adobe Photoshop Creative Cloud 2015. Photoshop is 25 years old. 25 years of fooling the world. So as this loads up, what we're going to do is design some graphics. And if we look at the documentation, we're going to make a variety of sizes. The thing with graphics is that is that um, if you have a small graphic small in dimensions and you blow it up so that it takes up more dimensions you'll usually lose a lot of quality the graphic will look pixelated it'll look blurry it'll look terrible maybe once in a while you've seen for example a menu at a low rent restaurant that the pictures on the menu look fuzzy. The, the food, the food on the plate looks terrible. Most likely they had a very low quality picture that then they blew up to print and then it looks terrible. You see that a lot. People that don't have experience in graphics. So taking a small picture, making it large, not good. The opposite though is okay. Taking a large picture and making it small, that's okay. Just the way graphics work when it's small, to make it large, it has to invent pixels. When you have a large picture down to make it smaller, it just has to throw away pixels that exist. The point of this is we're going to start on the largest dimension of the graphic first. We're going to design a graphic on the larger dimension and then make the smaller versions, rather than starting with the small version to make the large one. And what I'm going to say, actually, even though this is 192 pixels, the largest dimension, I'm still going to go much larger than that. Because you never know when the next version of Android is going to require a pixel size of 256. <laughs> or after that, who knows if it's going to need a 300 pixel sized icon as these things get more advanced. So obviously we can't predict what will happen, but if we future-proof ourselves a little bit, starting with larger graphics, and then shrinking them down as necessary. So when you load Photoshop, uh, have a welcome thing. Did you guys get also this welcome screen? Yeah, it's so slow. Hmm. Let's just close it. If you see this welcome thing, close it. We should get to the plain interface here, and we'll go up to the file menu at the top left. Just like most software, I have to create a new file in Word, or a new file in Excel, or a new HTML file. I need a new file in Photoshop, a new graphics file. So go up to File Menu, New. We need to give it some dimensions here. What are we going to work with? Uh, right now, on mine at least, it's set to print dimensions, which are inches. Inches don't really exist in the digital world. One inch on my uh, phone here could be one inch, but that same amount of pixels is going to be much smaller or possibly larger on my big screen. So we're not going to use inches. We're going to use pixels. That means you need to change this unit. Not seven inches. Click that and change it to pixels. And pixels are just the little dots on the screen. Oh, let me back up here, actually. We're going to make a brand new document. It's going to be called Untitled, but instead we're going to call the, the, the document Icon. 
This is going to be our icon for our project. We're going to use pixels. On this, uh, I'm going to skip width and height for the moment, and let's change resolution to 72. This is 72 pixels per inch. Don't worry about that exact meaning. Um, let's select 72 under resolution, and then now we can do with the width and the height. And as I said, this is going to be a square graphic, and I've got a dimension I've mentioned, but actually we're going to start much larger than that. So we're going to design a graphic that's 512 by 512. So that's already like four times larger than the largest current size. But perhaps on a future version of Android, we need that larger dimension. So I don't want to have to redraw my graphic or redesign my graphic um, in, a, in a few months or years or whatever. I can start with a large version and then shrink it down. Question? Why 512 rather than 500? There must be a reason, right? Yes, um, because the 512 uh, is a number, is, a, is more like a binary mathematical number. It doesn't really matter. I just chose 112 because that is uh, half a megabyte. If we double that, that should be 1,024, which is one megabyte. So I went with 512. Um, width and height resolution, uh, color mode 8-bit, that's normal. Uh, don't change color mode. Background contents, transparent. The documentation says we need a transparent graphic. That's because uh, if you look at your icons on your devices, for example, it's usually some sort of shape, and then behind the shape you can still see the background of your wallpaper, let's say. So if you have an app that's a heart, you want to see the empty parts of the heart. You don't want to see like a, a weird white square behind your icon. That's amateur as well. You want transparency behind the graphic of your icon. I can see that right here on my virtual device. Look at that gear icon. Imagine if that had a plain white background behind it. It would look terrible. So that's how we're dealing with transparency. Because all of these graphics, this is round, but there's still a square shape behind it. That's round. There's still a square behind it. This is, there's a square behind this. If we did not select if we did not specify a transparent background square, then we'd have a white background, a yellow background, whatever. It wouldn't look good because that's how most of the icons look here. Look at that. Behind the mail icon on the edges, I can see the background. And behind this little gesture thing, I, I see the background. Behind the camera, there's the background. That's why we're using transparency. So just confirm that these are my dimensions and click OK. That's going to give you uh, our graphic, our empty graphic here. Uh, most graphics software, if you didn't know, represents transparency with a checkerboard because you can't show what's invisible. Transparency is invisible. But to represent that, you usually see a checkerboard pattern. So this is transparent. We just need to see something to know it's transparent. Let's go up to the File menu, Save As. We haven't done very much, but we have created dimensions of a project, so let's go up to save, File Save As. You should save this somewhere on your flash drive. Does At this point you don't necessarily save it within your project folder because our current project is still a working file, a work in progress file. It's not the final graphic, obviously. I haven't done anything but it's a working file, therefore it's not going to go in my project just yet. So I'm going to save mine to the desktop. You should save yours on your flash drive so you don't lose it. I'm just calling it uh, icon. Actually, I like to put the dimensions in the file name, 512. That way I know that it's 512 pixels when I take a glance at it. 
because it's a working file, it's in the format of PSD. Now the documentation says use a PNG, a ping, but that's when we have our final graphic ready to add to our project. This is still a work in progress file. So it's in Photoshop format, PSD format. Um, that's going to save various metadata, so to speak, of the file, of the graphic. So I'm going to save that. Uh, you might get a thing about maximize compatibility. Just click OK. That's just going to be so you can open it in older versions of Photoshop. You might not have Photoshop CC 2015 at home. You might have Photoshop CS6, let's say. So if you maximize compatibility, you'll be able to open it later on your own computer. And so we'll, uh, I'll give you a quick crash course in Photoshop. Let me get a show of hands. How many of you have never used Photoshop before? A few people. Oh, less than I thought. Okay. Good. Everyone's got a little experience. You might not be a pro. doesn't matter. But uh, briefly, we've got panels all over the place at the top, at the left, etc. There's a left panel with various tools, brush tools, cropping tools, eraser tools, just a bunch of tools to edit our graphics. We've got a panel on the top here which will have various options. So at the moment I'm currently using the rectangular marquee tool. If you put your mouse on a tool it tells you what it is. Not really what it does, but what it is. If I click on another tool like this one, the move tool, notice how the options panel at the top changed. Every tool has different options. This is a very powerful, complex software, and therefore every tool can have multiple uses. So whenever you click on a tool, you get a variety of options up there. There's so many tools that they're actually not all visible. Do you see that most of these tools have a little triangle, little triangle in the corner. If you click and hold, you get more tools. So this is to make selections in squares, selections of circles, something called a lasso, different kinds of lassos, polygon, magnetic, this little thing here, that's the classic cropping tool, perspective slice. So there's all of these tools, sub-tools. It can be pretty complex. We'll see the tools panel on the left, options panel at the top. On the right we've also got more panels. We've got panels hidden in other panels, like history, properties, etc. And this shows color, libraries, layers. So the cool thing about Photoshop and most modern software, graphic software, is that you've got the concept of layers, where you can have two pieces of artwork this on top of this, and they don't interfere with each other. You can continue to move this object on top of this object, and it doesn't interfere. So we'll be taking advantage of that in a moment. So we're going to design an icon for our, for our app. And again, you might not be artistic. That's OK, because Photoshop is going to give us a bunch of pre-made shapes that we can play with, and we can add drop shadows and glass effects and all, all this kind of artistic, interesting stuff. So here's how we'll do it. Very near the bottom, you're going to see a square. That's the rectangle tool. Click and hold that tool, rectangle tool, and you get this one looks like a little splat. That's the custom shape tool. We have basic rectangles and ellipses, which are circles, and rounded rectangles and such. But we have this. This is pretty cool. These built-in uh, shapes. So click on Custom Shape Tool. Notice how your options at the top changes. It shows we've got the Shape Tool. It's going to be filled with the color black. Other options within height. Uh, don't worry. But then near the end of that row of options of shape, we have an arrow. So right now, if we were to click and drag on the artboard, that would draw 
a, uh, an arrow, a very simple arrow. I don't want that actually, so if you make a mistake in Word or other software, you have undo. You have undo also here on Photoshop. You can do Control Z to undo the last command. Or you can go up to Edit Menu, Undo, Custom Shape Tool, so it's going to take that back. One thing that Photoshop beginners always get confused of, let's say I drew one arrow and I drew another arrow. And I said, never mind, I don't want two arrows. So if I Control Z, it takes back the last arrow. So I would think Control Z one more time to take back the second to last. No, it brought it back. Control Z in Photoshop is a toggle. Take it back, bring it back. Whereas in Word or almost every other software, Control Z more than once will take you back, 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 back. So there is a way to go further back, step backwards, which is Control Alt Z. So you can, of course, go up to the menu to step back further, or just remember, okay, Control Alt Z takes it back. So I, I mention that because as we draw and we make mistakes, we're going to be undoing it. And if we make, need to undo more than once, don't get confused of Control Z not doing it. It's going to be Control Alt Z to go back further in, in your undo history. So okay, uh, we c it's not only that we can draw arrows. If you click the down triangle of that shape picker, We've got some other ones, some other kinds of arrows. Look at the little lightning bolt. Here's where we can make the, the next great Harry Potter app. Scissors. A little heart, like I mentioned. Paw print. We can make an app about dogs or pets. So if you let's say you select the paw print shape. The way you use it then is inside of this drawing area, you click and you drag. Um, but it starts from the the top left. So if, you, if you're if you in the center of your document, you click and drag, it's going to start from there, you see. I want it to start up here, and if you didn't start from the top over there, it's going to get pinned right there. So think about starting on the top left corner. You, of course, want to stay inside of this square. This is the maximum boundary of your graphic. So imagine when that gets shrunk down to the various sizes of your icons, I'm going to have this cute little paw print shape as my app's icon. It's currently drawing it with the black color, but I can click at the top here. Instead of filling it with black, I want purple or hot pink or yellow, green. There's a lot we can do, solid colors, blending colors, patterns, all of this advanced stuff. So you don't have to be artistic. You can use the shapes and then get artistic with the shapes. But these that I showed you here aren't the only ones. We've only got, it looks like about 10 or 12 shapes here, pretty limited. So actually, let me show you. We've got a, a, a ton of more shapes that we can work with. I'm going to undo this, step backward. And instead, click on the little triangle of the shape picker. Then there's a gear. Click on that gear. And then we can say, show me animal shapes, light bulb shapes. Question? Mine, the top line doesn't say shapes on you need to make sure you're on the shape tool, which is the little tool near the hand at the bottom. There's a hand, and then click and hold. I've got a square right above it. Yes, so you're going to click and hold it, and then you're going to see the custom shape tool. There's okay. tools hidden inside of tools. And then at the top right, uh, we're clicking on that gear. Let's say I clicked on the gear to give me extra options, and I want it to show me animals, all of the little animal drawings. So if you click on animals, it's going to ask you replace the current shapes or append, which is add to. Let's say we will click OK to replace the current shapes and show only animal shapes. So now we've got a snail.
So, okay, we've got a particular shape. Let's say instead symbols, web. Let's see what's under symbols. So that could be part of my app icon. I'm, I'm just drawing one, but obviously if I do something like this, these three stars here could be my app icon. And whatever is transparent will show through. So in this case, these white areas would show through. I have to fill them in if I really wanted to do that, but I'm gonna just experiment with some of these shapes. What I would recommend instead when you go to the gear, select all. Just show them all. I don't want to switch back and forth between them all. I just want to see them all and explore what's there. So select all and then click OK to replace the current set. And then you'll get a lot of them. You'll see this. Suddenly you have to scroll a lot. Well, if you have to scroll that much, it's annoying. So once you've got all of those shapes there, you can grab the corner of that um, panel and drag the corner to see more of them at once. So you see this little, these little uh, five dots. You can pull on that, and you'll see a bunch of them at once. So some, those are the animal ones, and you've got ribbons and musical notes and leaves. We'll do in honor of the Canadian election. We can do the. That's not, that's not the official Canadian flag, but um, the, the the leaf. So we've got some other like little shields and things. I can combine these. Look at this. What if I make a little shield like this, and I want to draw a different shape? Uh, this is where we then get a little more complex because uh, maybe I want this shape and inside of it I want a different shape. So let's say inside of that I want um, a heart shape. Now the problem is I'm drawing a heart shape here. Well I drew a black heart on a black shield so I don't see anything. So you have to remember to change the color. And let's say I'm trying to draw this, and I didn't draw it exactly right. I want this in the center. Mine is too far to the edge. Well, now we would use this move tool at the top, the very first tool. You can use that to move the objects. They're separate. They're separated with layers, remember I said. I can move the heart elsewhere. Let's say I want to move the shield now. Here's another tricky part. Okay, I'm going to move, click and move the shield. Huh, it's still moving the heart. That's because on our layers, I'm currently editing the heart layer. I want to edit the shield layer, so I have to click on the shield layer. It's like I've got these two pieces of paper here. I want to move the white paper, but I've got the yellow paper selected. So I have to select the yellow paper to move it. And that's selecting layers. So just click once on a layer. It should highlight. And now when you use the Move tool, which is the first tool, you can move it. And even if you're clicking on the heart, you're only going to move the shield. As you move things around, these little purple um, lines might appear. These are guides to tell you if you drop it here, it should be centered. Yes, like right there, I'm moving that heart, and it's it's in the middle of my of my document.
So what we'll do is, there's a lot to learn on Photoshop, of course. I'll show you a couple little tricks here and there, but what we're going to do is, uh, using those shapes, picking a couple colors, and I'm going to try to show you this thing called styles, but mine crashed. I'm going to show you styles, and that's going to be also another way to add a little bit more interest to your, to your graphics. So let me get back here. Okay, let's say I've got a shape that I've drawn. You should see a panel, Libraries, Adjustments, Styles. If you click on the Styles panel, and then you click one of those styles, you will automatically apply a lot of cool, interesting styles to your graphics. So, how do you go to Library? Well, that should be just visible right here. Do you see a Library panel on the right side? But it's, not, but it's not library, it's in the styles. I've seen the layers, channels, and tabs. Yours doesn't have it. Yours doesn't have it. Okay, okay. Uh, let me show up here then. Whenever you lose any panel, mine was on for some reason. Sorry, I didn't see that. You guys didn't have it. But if you don't see styles, you can bring back any panel from the window menu. So up on the window menu, it's alphabetical. Go to the window menu and look for styles, and then you'll get that panel. Let me tell you, when I turn on styles, you'll get a brand new panel somewhere on the right where you can select styles. And just like those shapes, well, this is interesting, but there's not a lot of them. Actually, there are. They're just hidden. So let's say you've activated styles, and I clicked on a few of these, and they look interesting, but it's not too many of them. If you wanted more styles, they're going to be hidden right here on that little, it's not a gear this time, it's this little uh, panel menu. So to the right of the styles panel, you should see a little menu icon, and you can show abstract styles. There's no show all, like shapes, unfortunately. Abstract styles, glass buttons, photographic effects, let's see that one. I'm going to go to Photographic Effects. It asks, would you like to replace the current one or add to it? I'll just click OK, replace it, so I can see the new ones. And now I've got these other styles that I can add. That's kind of interesting. So it'll look like it's, uh, it's very hard to see on the projector, but it looks like it's punched into the, into the screen. Now, while you're drawing your shapes, do you notice that you can draw the shape very wide or very tall? As you're drawing it, I still have my, my finger on the mouse button. As you're drawing it, before you let go, you can hold the Shift key on the keyboard, and it'll keep it in proportion. If I don't hold Shift, I might stretch it a little too far. It'll look weird. If you hold Shift while you're drawing it, it will keep it in proportion. You want to let go of the mouse and then the keyboard. Or else if you let go of the keyboard first, then the mouse, it'll just snap back to out of proportion. So that takes a little practice. Let go of the mouse, then the shift key to keep it in proportion.
Let me see what you did because a lot of different things can happen depending on what you do. So I was just mentioning here that you might things might not be behaving how you think, like I'm trying to change one shape but another one changes, because you've got it selected. So if you want to deselect, you want to just click on an empty area of the layer here and that will deselect it. Obviously if it's deselected then you can't move it or do other things. See that? It says could not move it because there's no layer selected. So just be aware of that. In order to do things to objects, usually they need to be selected and that's just simply clicking on the layer. So what we'll do is let's let's take a few minutes, maybe five minutes or something for you to be artistic and um, I didn't I, I taught you like 1% of 1% of Photoshop right now. Uh, there's still a lot that can possibly be done. So what we're going to do is just be artistic for a bit, save your work, control S, or just save your file. We're not ready to put this into our project yet, but I want to give you a moment to explore maybe uh, different colors and panels or whatever. Um, and we're going to make an icon for our graphic, and then in a few minutes we will continue, which is to get this graphic from it being a work in progress to the PNGs that the documentation needs. So just go ahead and take a, until let's say 710, until 710 at the most, think of something, draw something, play with some of these um, panels and colors and such. Maybe you'll find something interesting, ask questions, and then at uh, 710 we'll, we'll go on.